So this is the second um, in this hostile environment subject program series. So we had the first session a couple of weeks ago. Um, as for those of you who weren't here, we kicked off with a roundtable um, event. Um, so amongst other things, we were discussing sort of Britain's colonial past. We were thinking about um, the relationship between that and the kind of hostile environment policy that this kind of um, lecture series gets its title from, and then that in the kind of discussion afterwards, we were talking about the relationship between um, racism and Brexit. And of course, the last few days, it's even more nightmare around that. So um, today, we're also going to be sticking to the UK. Um, and then after this, this week, we'll kind of move further afield. Um, and, but we're going to sort of go back in time today to look at the kind of aftermath of September 11th and what happened around <coughs> citizenship, um, detention, borders, etc. Um, and you know the ensuing project of um, what our speaker today has termed state extremism in the aftermath of September 11th. Um, so we're looking at somehow the intersection of racial politics, the pathologizing of Muslims, particularly Muslim men, in the context of um, September 11th, militarized policing, um, and somehow the giving up of sovereign authority to the US in the sense of the kind of extradition um, processes that didn't follow you know, the procedures, etc. Um, so I'm really pleased that we have um, Nisha Kapoor with us here today. Um, she's um, joining us from Warwick University, where she recently joined Foda, you were in. in York University in sociology, and she's um, she led this like extremely important project called Deport, Deprive, Extradite, um, 21st Century State Extremism, which is very much dealing with these issues that I was speaking about. You know, looking at the relationship between race, citizenship, and the state in the context of the so-called war on terror, and it's sort of um, culminated in this very um, excellent book, which is actually. Um, I think a really important book, but also quite a difficult read. I mean, there are a lot of kind of harrowing sort of details in it, but um, uh, it's very much sort of, it's sort of showing, you know, all the claims around kind of the liberal, let's say, justice system of, the, of Britain and its so-called equality, it kind of lays bare some of those, the hollow nature of some of those claims. Um, so I'm gonna stop there great book, buy it, um, but you're going to be speaking about uh, work from the book or maybe work that's developed afterwards. Um, so Nisha is going to speak for around 40-50 minutes, then we'll have a short discussion and then we'll open it up for questions. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks for the um, warm welcome and the uh, invitation to be here today. Um, as Nishat said, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the themes that I talk about in the book, but taking them a bit further, um, and so reflect on um, a number of things I've been thinking about for a while about um, race, citizenship, and securitization. So what I'm going to present to you and what I'm going to talk through are, um, it's, it's not kind of fixed and finalized talk, they're kind of, um, I guess I'm going to think aloud with you. and. Um, and so very much kind of, you know, so that my thoughts and um, points here are, are sort of very much in process and I would very much welcome kind of all comments, conversation, questions um, afterwards. So, um, as Nishat said, my, um, the, the book, Deport to Private Extradite, um, focused on uh, a small number of Cases, a small number of uh, Muslim men who had extreme, who had uh, experienced the extreme ends of um, state policing, um, uh, of the sort of securitization uh, te technologies and disciplinary um, powers that have been enhanced um, across the security states uh, as a whole, but um, specifically, um, you know, enhanced in, in the context of the war on terror. And what I try to do in the book is take these small number of cases to both discuss kind of the stream, the extreme ends of state power, but also think about um, what they illuminate about the security state and the social um, more, more broadly. Um, and what I want to do, though there was kind of a number of um, different elements of um, what 
what we might call sort of democracy and democratic um, uh, processes, but uh, what you know have been kind of manipulated, have been enhanced, or have, have been kind of um, become increasingly securitized in this context. Um, it's one of the things that um, I focus on, and I want to elaborate more on in this talk, is kind of the co-option of citizenship. So. The, the kind of starting point, uh, or one of the sort of points that I, I explore in the talk is the way in which through, on the back of these cases, on the back of um, the terrorism suspect, the state is able to extend, the security state is able to extend its power to deprive citizenship. Um, and, you know, obviously it, it has kind of broader implications uh, for the way in which we conceive, we conceptualize, we um, the kind of public and political discourses around what citizenship is. But what I want to do today is think about the ways in which um, citizenship has been co-opted for securitization by the security state as a particular surveillance tool. And so the, the, and to think about the ways in which the moral economy of citizenship that's attached to citizenship, so the good citizen, bad citizen, which plays out on a broader agenda, you know, a, a broader kind of spectrum, um, is, is, is being used or co-opted by the security state um, to enhance its own kind of function through um, requiring individuals to <coughs> surveil and um, to be surveilled, so to act as informants. And so this is kind of what I'm going to walk through uh, through this talk. <coughs> OK, so the deportation of Windrush Generation citizens was revealing on many fronts, not least perhaps because in exposing the racial permeability of the immigrant citizen boundary, um, you know, we know that the hostile environment was never, the, the sort of laws of the hostile environment were never intended to just police the immigrant. Um, it brought to public attention the full weight of colonial legacies which have preserved um, racialized ex exclusions inherent within British citizenship. Um, so that citizenship, access to it, denial of it, um, you know, is bound within sort of racially, um, you know, is, is racially bound. And there's been much that's been commented on this. So what's particularly noteworthy about the Windrush moment is not so much um, that, uh, you know, it's a kind of stark expression of black um, bodies not belonging of or not being conceived of as um, part of the nation. Um, but there's, there's, you know, there's something very specific in this moment about kind of, um, about how British citizens long-term resident can be, um, you know, can be actually deported, can be made deportable, that kind of um, ex excluding function has sort of become stronger. Um, we know that immigration policy has always been hostile. We can think about the immigration policies of the 1970s, we can think about the virginity test against South Asian women, we can think about, um, you know, the, the growth of deport uh, detention centers in relation to um, the uh, uh, securitization of asylum. Um, you know, we can think about the ways in which um, you know, and the, the related kind of uh, hostility in, in, in public environments with the, with the growth of the far right that, um, that cashes in on the sort of um, political and the, the mainstream political anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, but the, there's something specific, the specific kind of, um, I guess, technologies of uh, the hostility um, that are, are really apparent with, with this kind of um, present hostile environment, the ways in which it's usually spoken of in relation to immigration debate, um, is the way in which uh, you know, multiple kind of civic, social, welfare institutions have been co-opted and, and the folks that work in them have been co-opted into sort of doing the into doing the surveillance. So in this sense, um, the hostile environment is not simply cultivated through law, um, which restricts access to key welfare and social services, but through layers of bureaucracy, through uh, an administration, through fear-mongering, an acute sense of precariousness, and ultimately through a willingness of practitioners of the public at large and professionals to surveil. And I think perhaps what's pertinent in the current moment is the um, 
is the coercive is the enforcement of the coercive mechanism to do this. So we've always, you know, for, we could argue that there's lots of different moments in which the surveillance society comes in, to, you know, is is uh, is an operation, but the enhancement increase, you know, so the restriction, you know, so the um, repercussions for universities or for other institutions for not complying with immigration. Um, with immigration laws that require this kind of surveillance are increasingly coercive. So while the broader logic, while the broader kind of racialized logics and underpinning the exclusionary nature of citizenship um, have been exposed um, in the Windrush moment, and um, we get a sense of um, kind of the expansion of the internal border. Um, so you know, the, the kind of numerous checkpoints, if you like, that we have in place. Um, I'm not moving my slide. Um, and the, um, the, the, the numerous um, checkpoints that we have in place for, um, for doing kind of, uh, you know, for, for enacting the, the border. So um, housing, education, welfare, uh, access to social services, access to healthcare, um, getting a driving license and so on. Um, you know, this, this kind of racialized dimension of citizenship is made, is made apparent. Um, what I think is um, the racialized regime that has been instrumental for uh, adapting the contours of citizenship and for mobilizing citizenship as a security function has been um, not the threat of the immigrant, but the threat of the terrorist. So, um, if we see the kind of ultimate, uh, you know, uh, the ultimate kind of expression of who is not a citizen in the Windrush moment, um, the, the, the manipulation or the adaptation of what citizenship does and can do, the kind of extension of power to deprive, has all been cultivated through the threat of the terrorist, through the kind of the, the national security lens. Um, and so it's here that I want to revisit and elaborate on um, both the extension of deprivation powers, the role of the sort of um, the bad citizen as the terrorist suspect, what that figure of the terrorist suspect has been able to do in terms of enhanced security powers, but also how um, what how analysis of this of the sort of disciplinary powers, the disciplinary mechanisms that are enforced at this end illuminates a kind of um, strategies or policing mechanisms that are, are, are being kind of um, enforced on a, on a wider scale, but in a less acute sense. So, um, the, okay, so let me say something about the security state. Though we might think of the security state, as um, Nicholas de Genova suggests, as an epistemological object already included in the very hypothesis that seeks to comprehend it, in as much as it may remain partial, incipient, and incomplete, the security state is nevertheless indicative of definite tendencies, directions, and orientations. There are some, um, there are some immediate objectives um, or propensities or purposes of the security state that come to mind for me, and this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just things um, that I was kind of thinking, well, okay, what, 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 what could the security state do? What is its function? Firstly, um, it functions to produce a threat. <coughs> Secondly, um, uh, and so, you know, it has to create a suspect population. Secondly, its role is border management and it has a, a role for border management and containment. Thirdly, the task of surveillance. And fourthly, um, the sort of imposition, implementation of a hegemonic disposition for securitization, which though encompasses both consent, um, both sort of um, mechanisms that work by consensus and coercion, um, you know, the security state is ultimately kind of um, bent on, in, you know, on, on, on kind of enhanced, on um, administering those kind of most coercive ends of disciplinary power. So there are things that, that, that both rely on 
um, on disciplining bodies through consensus and um, coercion, but the coercive function is um, is something that it's able to um, enhance kind of particularly acutely. So, um, is the security states um, is the security state's investment in a particular moral economy of citizenship that interests me here? So, with the um, broad terrain of citizenship <coughs> studies, there's been much reflection on the kind of good citizen, bad citizen on the way in which there's a normal, you know, kind of normative um, framings of citizenship are invoked about kind of norms, values, and behaviors of what constitutes a good citizen versus a bad citizen. And, um, you know, this is a way to kind of regulate behaviors on, on a broader scale. And what I kind of think, what I want to explore here is the way in which the security state has infiltrated those discourses of good citizen, bad citizen, to construct its own moral economy with the effect of hardening the punitive end of state disciplinary power of technologies, and also sustaining and extending um, the surveillance function that, that it, uh, is, is one of its kind of aspects. So, um, the, the bad citizen. Um, in the kind of spectrum of, of what's happened to citizenship, um, I'm suggesting to you, um, as I said, that the, the kind of the terrorist suspect, the sort of irredeemable figure of the terrorist has been kind of critical to the extension of um, powers to deprive citizenship. So in um, 2000, in the immediate days after 9-11 attacks, the um, the media start a public a, a, a campaign um, pointing out that there's a number of Islamist preachers resident in the UK who uh, are the kind of domestic Osama bin Laden. Um, and they um, sort of mobilize, if, you know, so they, they start a kind of um, a campaign to call for the deportation of a number of them, and Abu Hamza becomes a kind of face of this. Um, Abu Hamza can't be deported because he's a British citizen. Um, and once this is revealed, um, there's a kind of mass campaign mobilization to, uh, you know, to request that his citizenship be deprived. Um, and the Sun, the Daily Mail, and the Bravilla newspapers join in. Um, they encourage, you know, the readers write in in response um, and ask, you know, are sort of furious that he can't be deported. David Blunkett, who's the Home Secretary at the time, receives a raft of letters from the public demanding that Abu Hamza be deported. And in 2002, a first piece of legislation is, uh, or, or uh, an extension of the powers that the state ha currently has to deprive citizenship is passed, um, which, which is informally called the Hamza Amendment because it's in his name that the legis you know, that it's happened, it's against him that the powers were first used. Um, so in order for him to be deportable, but for him to be, um, you know, deported, he uh, needs to be stripped of his citizenship. And these powers are extended again in 2006, and they're extended again in 2014, all on the back of high-profile or terrorism cases, or the, the broader kind of um, you know, war on terror, the securitization agenda. And in 2014, the piece of legislation that's passed is a piece of legislation which says that you can, if you can make somebody stateless if the Home Secretary believes they can acquire citizenship elsewhere. So it's a massive extension of the powers to expel. Um, and this has gone, this has worked in tandem with other, other kind of disciplinary powers, right? Other technologies. So um, as, you know, in the cases, so David Cameron, I think 2014 or 15 noted that we had all these powers to deprive citizenship, but for, which can work for British-born citizens as well as naturalized citizens. If you have a British-born, if you have dual citizenship, or uh, the possibilities of dual citizenship, but there wasn't anything in place for British-born citizens who didn't, you know, who, who, where there wasn't a kind of another possibility of citizenship. And so passport removals and temporary exclusion orders are introduced, 
And so there's a whole bunch of people who start to have their passports cancelled or confiscated um, as a kind of way of, um, which, which obviously inflicts, uh, you know, inhibits ability to travel, but it also inhibits ability to access all those kind of welfare services or um, social services that now require that kind of border check. Um, but part of this coercive function and what's apparent in all of the, so we did a number of interviews with individuals who, on whom um, this, uh, who, who have experienced these kind of measures. Um, so certainly kind of passport cancellation, uh, who've been, had their passports canceled or who've been um, deprived of their citizenship in one way or another. And um, in you know, another part of this coercive mechanism is that you are asked to, um, you're asked to work for MI5, you're asked to work for the security services, you're asked to work as an informant. Um, and this is a consistent story, it's been reported widely in the press, it, it's consistently crossed up in the people we speak, you know, in the interviews, um, human rights lawyers talk about it frequently. Um, and so the, there are multiple things happening here, that so the, the kind of powers to kind of expel, the ultimate punishment is extended and enhanced and the kind of coercive function of acting as an informant is part of that punishment, but it's also a possibility for redemption. It's also a possibility um, of, or provides a possibility for being treated, um, or for being saved, um, for being, so, so um, there's one kind of case that exemplifies this quite well. Mahadi Hashi is, um, uh, comes under surveillance in um, the sort of mid 2000s, he is um, he's Somalian. Uh, he works as a community worker in his um, local neighborhood. Um, he's approached by security services on a number of occasions to work for them. He refuses. He refuses to comply. He resists. He refuses to be coerced. Um, and they kind of point out to him. They stop him at an airport on a number of occasions. He goes to the press and reports his story in the press, published the story. Um, but he's approached again by, so on, on the first occasion he's, um, he's stopped in an airport, the security service say to him, um, you know, if you travel, we'll make, you know, things will be difficult. And lo and behold, when he reaches Somali, he's deported back to the UK. And on the second occasion when this happens, again, he's warned. Um, and on this occasion, um, because again, he refuses to kind of and work with them, uh, he's um, eventually detained um, and uh, deprived of his citizenship, detained in a clandestine prison in Djibouti, and subsequently ultimately rendered to the US to solitary confinement um, in a US supermax prison. So there's a kind of global transfer of his incarceration, but the British state is deprived of him of his citizenship, so it's removed itself of accountability. Um, you know, but, but prior to this kind of point, he's always told the possibility of um, of being kind of incorporated would be there if he was willing to um, to act as an informant. Um, and so this this uh, security, this kind of um, way of doing um, securitization is also something that's kind of working not just at the extreme level or, or not just in these kind of minimal number of cases, but then when we talk, when we think about the kind of surveillance of Muslim communities en masse under the counter-terrorism <coughs> agenda, um, co you know, plays out on a much wider scale. And this is where the kind of co-option of um, citizenship, the moral economy of citizenship, I think comes into its own. Um, so, Uh, okay. So the um the dis the, the kind of um the security state um kind of co option of this um of the moral you know this kind of moral economy has has really come into its own in the civic integration narratives around kind of who, you know, so who counts as the, the, the kind of whole policy spectrum, the whole um, uh, political discourse around who, who constitutes, you know, who counts as kind of good citizen, who counts as bad citizen, 
who is integratable um, and who is not. But it's because there's been sort of particular, particularly pervasive in relation to the figure of the Muslim. So much has been said about the um, disciplinary nature of various civic integration programs which have employed yardsticks such as um, levels of English proficiency, language, knowledge of British civil society, um, and history for maintaining the marginalization of Muslims, for marking Muslims as a constant outside, for maintaining racist um, exclusions and subordination within the nationalist project. The incorporation of securitization, namely through the prevent agenda, into um, the omnipresent concern with community cohesion and dutiful citizenship has enabled particular enhancements to the um, set requirements or thresholds of integration. But as the development, as this development has fortified and hardened racist exclusions within the workings of the nation state, for the security state, it's also enabled um, the elaboration of its surveillance tool. Um, and there's a number of uh, ways that we can kind of exemplify this if we were to think about, you know, so, so the rollout of Prevent on a kind of broader community level and the number of individuals caught up in kind of um, surveillance databases who are asked to act to work as informants um, is quite prolific. I think there's um, something sort of particularly um, illustrative in the way in which Muslim women, particularly uh, in, in the way in which Muslim women have been sort of co-opted, and uh, or uh, the way in which the sort of political um, agenda around this has tried to co-opt Muslim women. So in post 77 Britain, as domestic counterterrorism policing intensified. The positioning of Muslim women came um, to be ingrained in policy through the notion of their cultural and ideological importance within Muslim families and communities, largely through their role as mothers. In late 2007, Hazel Blears, um, the then Secretary of State uh, for Communities and Local Government, responding precisely to a call against um, only representing Muslim women as victims of the stereotype of, of the need to save Muslim women. Um, explained that Muslim women, like all women, played a particularly important part in binding families together as mothers, daughters, wives, sisters, um, but held a particularly unique moral authority within their communities and argued that more needed to be done to value their economic, cultural, and civic contributions. Through lip, though lip service was paid to this broad array of contributions um, offered by, uh, by Muslim women, the emphasis on mothering and their role as mothers has been particularly um, pertinent. Um, there's a particular uh, organi political organization that's, um, <coughs> that, that, um, uh, under the New Labour, uh, uh, in 2007, the uh, National Muslim Women's Advisory Group that's kind of he uh, started up under Hazel Blears. And um, the, the bodies tasked with achieving the increased representation of Muslim women in civil society, um, but it's funded through prevent monies. And so this, um, this emphasis on kind of increased participation or increased recognition of contributions and civic integration of Muslim women is very much tied up with um, the kind of securitization agenda and, and the sort of agenda the sort of um, de-radicalization, anti-extremism agendas. And so um, a key remit of this particular group um, from the outset would be to encourage Muslim women to influence and challenge the false and perverted ideology spread by extremists um, and give our young people skills and knowledge to turn their back on hate, quote. The group was asked to advise government on the role they can play in winning hearts and minds of, um, of, of Muslim communities, of their, of their kind of and brethren. Um, and it's an agenda that's been intent, you know, kind of um, reform, reformulated under conservatives through Inspire, headed by Sarah Khan, um, and uh, which has not only kind of um, relied on the educated role that women can play, but has also explicitly asked for um, women to, to inform, right, to report um, their brothers, their fathers, their um, you know family members for any signs of, re of 
radicalization or extremism. Um, and so the, the kind of whole um, narrative around kind of, uh, you know, integration is very much kind of intertwined then with um, this sort of informant, this security function. Um, and it, you know, it, it kind of takes on a, a double function. So through its welfare arms, the security state attempts to secure good citizenship um, as, as a, a means of kind of raising those our children. So on the one hand, it's, it's trying to uh, kind of influence the sort of values, behaviors, norms that, um, that Muslim uh, families are imposing on their children. And on the other hand, is saying that in order to be a you know in order to be a dutiful citizen, you need to report anything that be, you know that is is deemed to be suspicious. Um, and though there's a kind of it, this begins in a kind of consensual you know in a consensual way, the stakes I, I'm 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 not sure you know whether it's to do with um, the lack of. The sort of ineffectiveness of this as um, as, as a policy approach, but um, in about 2014-15, the number of Muslim women being arrested starts to increase quite significantly, um, and the, and the, they're kind of subjected to the same kinds of things um, around sort of um, you know workers' informants, and the charges will be dropped, um, and so the kind of coercive mess. The, the coercive mechanism around sort of surveillance has intensified, um, and in some of the cases where again um, this refusal to act as informants has led to passport cancellations, or you know these things are happening in tandem. I'm not trying to suggest one is, is causal, but they work together. So the refusal to you know when one is arrested and no charges dropped, and women are asked to act as informants, um, one of the kind of things that happens is their passports are cancelled. Um, and you know, on on um, on willingness to comply, it's made apparent that those passports can be um, uh, can be given back. Uh, but but equally, um, women are you know, so it's not just their, their sort of passports that are taken away or their citizenship that's taken away, but also their children. So there's a real sort of gendered way in which punishment is happening too. Um, and then. We can also think about, um, in terms of this kind of, um, the, the sort of the moral compass of citizenship then, if, if the treatment of women and mothers acts as, um, as one exemplar, the, um, the other exemplar uh, is the surveillance as a condition for entry into citizenship. So the whole other, um, there's a whole other, I'm not doing very well with my picture, um, there's a whole other um, bunch of work that we've been doing, which looks at the um, applications for citizenship and the denials of those applications. And since 2000, and, um, since 2007, <coughs> eight, um, the refusals of citizenship on the grounds of bad character has become increasingly important, such that in the last couple of years it's become the principal reason why citizenship is being denied. So of all the applications that are refused citizenship, denial on the grounds of bad character has become you know, the sort of principal reason. Um, and again, this feeds into the sort of moral economy of citizenship. So it's not just whereas um, you know, some years ago, residency requirements, residency was the principal reason um, you know, there are was, there was certain um, uh, object, you know, there are certain kind of requirements that needed to be filled, ha uh, fulfilled before you could become a British citizen, um, principally around how long you've been resident um, in the country. Um, this character test has become increasingly important and it's tied in with this um, sort of civic, you know, civic agenda around sort of citizenship, around knowing, um, you know, being mindful of um, what it means, uh, you know, about British culture, British history, British values, um, around uh, British you know, knowledge of kind of um, British history uh, in, in a particular, you know, in a very narrow sense. In, um, so the, 
the, the good character test um, then includes many things. Um, it's revised as part of broader immigration citizenship reforms brought, uh, brought uh, in under Gordon Brown um, in, in 2009. The um, Brown government's path to citizenship strengthened the notion in development for some time that citizenship was something that needed to be earned. The 2009 enhancement centered around the stage process, um, uh, so, so one would have to um, demonstrate a kind of uh, strong you know, contribution to social and economic life in a number of ways, um, but you would have to have sufficient knowledge of life in the UK and English language requirements uh, would need to be demonstrated alongside this kind of need to demonstrate reputable character. Uh, and character encompassed multiple considerations, including previous criminal convictions and suspected criminality, but also civil society contributions such as paying taxes, civic engagement, and so on. Um, the sort of implementation of a stricter test around 2009 was argued in the House of Commons to be largely because some of the other tests that were in place weren't restricting enough people from entry into the into the sort of polity, into the political community. There's been no official legal definition of what constitutes bad character, but 2013 Home Office policy guidance indicates that it incorporated not abiding by or respecting the law, being associated with war crimes, not having one's financial affairs in appropriate order, being involved in notorious activities that cast serious doubt on standing in the local community, being honest with UK government or having previously uh, been deprived of citizenship. Um, it states specifically that current behaviors such as divorce, promiscuity, drinking or gambling, eccentricity and unemployment or working habits are not normally constituted as bad character, but you know, it, there's a possibility that they might be taken into consideration. Um, and parenting debt back bankruptcy factor two so the character test has been really important for, for um, restricting citizenship from individuals who come into the UK via asylum, because it's near impossible to arrive in the country um, as an asylum seeker without incurring some kind of immigration infraction. And so in, the large, in, 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 in large part, when you kind of, um, we got some data via FOI requests, when you kind of look at the breakdown of who's being refused citizenship on character tests, there's some kind of correlation between the um, applicants that come from, you know, the countries where most asylum applications come from, and then five years later, um, where the most uh, refusals on character grounds come from. But within the character assessment, there's a specific element that focuses on national security. Um, and again, the security state, um, in, this surveillance, in its surveillance mechanism um, comes in to its own. Um, and so there's a number of cases where individuals are asked, uh, where individuals are, have been asked to work as informants in exchange for, you know, and, and, and would be guaranteed citizenship. This um, SAIAC, the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, um, is uh, the immigration, uh, is the immigration court that deals with uh, cases where individuals who have been, uh, who are facing deportation or have been deprived, uh, who have been denied citizenship on security grounds can have their cases appealed. Um, and the court works in uh, secret, so it's allowed to hear evidence, um, secret evidence, uh, of which the appellant or, and their lawyer is not privy to. Um, and so these kind of national, so when you refuse citizenship on, um, when you're denied citizenship on national security grounds, you can appeal to SIAC. And if you look through, um, you know, we've analyzed a, a number of the court judgments that go through that court, and um, it becomes, uh, you know, so, and there's, there's, there's lots of kind of examples of, of then how that, you know, plays out. So um, the guidance states that a person might be able to satisfy um, the good character requirement in, in the, um, case of terrorism, if they presented strong evidence of choosing um, associates. So, so, one, so, so I, sorry, I should say that the, one of the questions that um, you're asked in relation to the character test 
is have you engaged, um, so there's three questions around engagement in terrorist activities, and the third is have you engaged in any other activities which might indicate that you might be considered a person of good or bad, um, in any other activities which might be, uh, which might indicate that you might, may not be considered to be a person of good or bad character. And um, it's been reported to be a kind of catch-all question so that if you have immediately answered that you have not engaged in any terrorist act activities, there's a kind of, um, a broader way to, um, to find you guilty of something um, else that, that might be related, whatever related means. And in practice, this has meant that if you are associate, if you know somebody else, if you're associated with somebody else that is caught up in the, in the sort of um, security apparatus, so if, if you're associated with somebody else who's known to security services, um, that association in itself can, can tar your character. It works, it's, it's a similar way to the kind of gang policing mechanism. So just by association, you then become, um, there's a possibility of a kind of mark against your character. Um, so you can imagine how this works on a kind of family uh, level, on a community level, and so on. Um, and there's a number of individuals who appeal against their, um, against being refused citizenship. Uh, it, it comes to light that it's this kind of catch-all question that's the reason why they're refused. So it's um, an association with somebody else and a refusal to then uh, either act as a, you know, act, work for MI5 or um, inform on that particular associate um, becomes the kind of bad character test. So you have to actually show a willingness to um, to not to um, correct that uh, to, to not just not be associated with that person, but to actually correct the um, <coughs> bad behaviours of that person through working as an informer. So um, just to kind of end um, then. I want to say that the full impact of the security state's co-option of the moral economy of citizenship comes to light when we consider its infiltration into everyday space, its um, penetration into public space, um, which is always involving in, uh, invoking and reifying a racialized gaze of surveillance, um, means that in its full effect and execution, it, it returns a kind of normalizing discourse of um, securitization. So when we go to the cinema and um, we see um, signs like this encouraging us to act, especially if we go to the cinema in um, particular, um, you know, high ethnic minority um, concentration neighborhoods, um, or when we sit on public transport, um, this uh, sort of public, this kind of the extent of public surveillance of the security state's um, surveilling tool uh, comes into its own. So I've recently um, moved to the Midlands from York and I sit on a train every day and um, hear the kind of see it, say it, sort it thing um, come out from, you know, announced um, at every stop. But it feels that it's uh, repeated much more prolifically than on the kind of East Coast train that I used to get. Um, and you know, I, I'm not sure if that's kind of just my own um, sensitivity to it, but there's um, something about the way in which there's a sort of normalizing, uh, you know, there's a, a sort of very much a routinization of this um, call to surveillance and a kind of um, emphasis on, the, on surveillance being part of civic duty, <coughs> of um, you know, being a good citizen. Um, and, and a sense in which it kind of does, um, what Michael Billig calls kind of everyday flagging, but in a different context. So there's a kind of ritualization and normalization to this. And um, where, where, you know, even if we don't hear it, um, and there's a sense when um, announcements are repeated all the time that we don't hear them. Um, but, but there's a kind of, um, a sort of warning function that it poses. Um, project Saboteur, of which this is part, is a broader policing project that um, oh, that uh, is functions to um, it's, 
it, the project saboteur is a kind of Latin word for sort of watcher, observer, preserver, and it's it, it's relate, it refers to um, a policing um, operation that involves the deployment of unpredictable, highly visible police who are there to sort of deter, detect, and disrupt hostile reconnaissance of a criminal or terrorist in kind of spaces around public transport. Um, the interests of national safety, officers turn up unannounced at various locations, carry out deployments. There's a kind of extreme end of, um, of, of securitization that this is connected to. So there's a kind of unpredictability of policing, um, the possibility of sort of policing intervention in public spaces, um, and the kind of, so the, the constant announcements in some ways kind of a, are a flag or an indication of the possibility of that, the need, um, uh, the, the sort of warning or the need for those um, security operations, for, for those security operations to exist. Um, and so the, the kind of, the requirement or the request or the announcements of this function, you know, of the sort of, um, the need or the duty to do surveillance kind of comes to um, comes to inflict comes to sort of you know uh, infiltrate into the broader um, the the broader social body and sort of in some way perhaps renders the entire body politic um, a surveilling injunction. <coughs> but then there's <coughs> Holy 